Yes. Um, yeah, Paris is a surprise actually, and I'm I'm really happy to stand here uh, today together with Per. We have been working now a couple of months uh, to set up a research cooperation together. And from a PUF perspective, uh, we believe that it's really important to work together with research as one way to learn more about responsible gaming. Uh, and in this research cooperation, together with Stockholm University, PUF will finance a PhD student for four years. And uh, these research studies will focus on the communication, so how we can communicate with the customers uh, in order to prevent problem gaming. And uh, for example, one of the things that we will be doing is, is looking into how we can get the customers to set limits and also to change their behaviors in different ways. And for me, I believe that what makes this extra interesting is that we will do the studies on the puff.com online website and that we will work with very concrete questions. And of course, we at PUFF want to be transparent about the results and I hope that it will also help the rest of the industry and other operators uh, with the responsible gaming work as well. But I will now leave the floor to Per, uh, who will give you more details about the research and what will be done. Uh, Per is a board-certified psychologist, psychotherapist and specialist in cl clinical psychology and he works as a professor and head of the subdivision sub of clinical psychology at Stockholm University. Um, and Per will be the main supervisor for this PhD stu student and he will now give us some more details about this exciting project. Yes! Welcome Per. So I, I um, was told that this was supposed to be a, a surprise, and when I came here with the, uh, with the airport, uh, to the airport, I was uh, also told that I, there would be a taxi picking me up, and then uh, it was a taxi picking me up, and, and the taxi driver shouted, call bring, and then someone else said, yes, that's me, <laughs> uh, and that was you. Uh, so maybe, is this the Twilight Zone? Do I have a new wife? Uh, so then I, I started playing along with this Twilight Zone thing, and then uh, I asked her, uh, she, she's working for the... Um, Gambling compliance, uh, a, a newspaper or a news agency, uh, and then I asked her. So, what are you doing here? Are you? Uh, wh what are you most excited about covering? And then I, I tried to prime her into saying like this, uh, this um, uh, research initiative. And then I heard said that I've heard rumors that this person is supposedly really intelligent and, and things. And then <laughs> she didn't know, but now she knows. <laughs> so I think that's fun. Let me see if I can get this working now. In some way, it's almost done. So I think this is it, right? Yeah. So it started uh, for me in 2004, uh, meeting uh, Roger Edlund. Uh, some of you might know him. He was the one that talked me into starting with uh, gambling research. Uh, it involved uh, being really far north and also a bottle of wine. Uh, so that was, uh, thank you, Roger. But he's, he's not here, but maybe he's following in, in like a, um, streaming. Uh, streaming. So uh, after, uh, so he, he uh, got me into wanting to uh, do things on the internet, internet-based research. I've, I've done quite a lot for anxiety and depression, and he said that wouldn't it be a good idea to do this on, on gambling? Uh, so I did that, and I uh, proposed this together with uh, Roger and some others. Uh, um, um, uh, Jac Jacob Johnson as well. Uh, so I got a postdoc from the Swedish uh, uh, National Institute for, of Public Health doing gambling research or specifically treatment research. So the first study, this is the background because the talk is uh, gambling research past, present and future and the future is the surprise. So just uh, like a background first. So the background is that I, I did a study on 66 people being randomized to internet-based research uh, internet-based uh, interventions for people uh, really fulfilling the DSM criteria for, for gambling disorder. Um, so what we found was that uh, uh, we could see that the uh, uh, composite between group effect sizes at pre-treatment or uh, at post-treatment were um, moderate or, or actually to the large extent, but then uh, for the follow-up, we could see that these nice uh, effect sizes were maintained and even uh, increased. And I think that's really interesting that we also included the 36-month follow-up in, in this study. 
but in that study, it, it wasn't clear whether or not this actually worked for people that did have depression, comorbid depression, because we screened out people that uh, seemed to have a comorbid depression. And maybe that's not the, the, uh, the cases that you actually meet in real life, or at least not everyone. So then we did another study uh, on 284 people, and now we included everyone, because in the first study we randomized them to either the treatment or a weightless control. Uh, so uh, people might run the risk of not getting treatment immediately. But in this other treatment study, then we randomized people to getting treatment, and that's the only thing. We didn't randomize them. We, they, they got treatment, but uh, the good thing was that we didn't screen out uh, almost anyone, and not because, uh, at least because they were uh, depressed. So they could be really depressed, and I think that was, was uh, uh, interesting. And the good thing about this study was that we tried to look at um, were there any I mean, th th this, does this work in, um, in a more depressed group? Yes, it did. Uh, and the most interesting part, I think, uh, is that we could see that if you knew things before going into treatment, if you had some information from the, from the uh, participants that fulfilled the, uh, the criteria for gambling disorder, if you knew th some things, uh, then you would be rather good at predicting who would benefit and who would not benefit from, from treatment. So that was things like work-life work -life satisfaction, primary gambling activity, depths due to gambling, social support, person personal yearly salary, alcohol consumption, and uh, also dissociative uh, gambling. Uh, so that was interesting, I think. Uh, after that, uh, I wanted to maybe meet people. So the final study I'll be talking about in the past uh, is this study looking at motivational interviewing. Uh, individually, so that would be four sessions of motivational interviewing with one person face-to-face -face in, in real time, uh, sitting in the same room, not, no internet, and that was uh, compared to cognitive behavior therapy, group therapy, uh, eight times. So it's quite a lot of, of difference between only getting four sessions of motivational interviewing on the one hand or being in a, in a group setting uh, where you got cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and then we also had a, a control group, a wait list. So what happened? Uh, we had 150 people um, being part of this, and we could see that th there were differences in, in uh, uh, whether or not you got treatment versus no treatment, but there were any no differences between getting uh, the motivational interviewing versus the cognitive behavior group therapy. So if you do something, then that's better than doing nothing. Uh, and is that a surprise? Uh, maybe or maybe not. I think if if you do, if you're if you're ready to seek treatment and uh, ready to go to an open clinic in Sweden uh, and being a part of a, a group therapy, then maybe you've come so far that you there is a lot of, of self uh, self um, uh, you could you could um, spontaneously remit. So um, maybe this is just a funny slide. This is not scientific at all. Maybe this would suit a TED Talk if I ever get to do one. Uh, so uh, could you do whatever? Could you just watch this person? Uh, I guess not. But I think it's, it's important that you do something uh, and then you measure if it works or not. But I think the big problem is that most people do not seek treatment. So if you do, th do something that's cognitive behavior therapy or motivational interviewing, that, that is good. Uh, for the most uh, cases, uh, but it's uh, the big problem is, is getting people to to this. So uh, here's another one. This is more of the the present thing that I'm doing. This is uh, um, Henrik Josefsson, one of my PhD students uh, that I'm co-supervisor of. He's uh, thinking here. He's not thinking how can I be so relaxed without having anything to sit on. It's a mystery, I think. Uh, but uh, what is he thinking about? He's thinking about uh, maybe matching things. Uh, and the latest is that he. he has been thinking about what about uh, problem gamblers and, and the ones that do drink alcohol? Is there anything specific about these people? Uh, and then he uh, wanted to look at what about these people uh, when they do get treatment? Uh, so um, is there a difference if, between uh, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral group therapy? So this is uh, the uh, NODS score, which is uh, the scores after having had treatment. So this is six months after having had treatment, so people are better. Uh, so the scores will be lower uh, because they got either the motivational interviewing or the CBT. Uh, and this is uh, only preliminary results. So when you uh, look at them, uh, then you should, should think that this is preliminary and can be changed in the future. But I think it's interesting to see that if you, if you are 
uh, a person that have alcohol problems, and you are randomized, you, you're not getting to choose, but you are randomized to motiva in motivational interviewing, then your, post, uh, your score at six month follow-up will be lower than if you uh, have no alcohol problem. And there is interesting results here because there is an interaction. So it seems like if you have alcohol problems, then you should opt for the motivational interviewing rather than the group cognitive behavior therapy. And this is significant. So this is what he's thinking about, and, and he will soon be writing up his thesis. So if you want to attend that, that's something I would recommend. Um, and two more things that I'm doing. Uh, uh, this is a, a really nice, if you speak Swedish or if you want to learn Swedish, then you should go to this really excellent blog. It's called Spelforskning, uh, gambling research or game research. Uh, and here we post a lot of interesting things. And, and uh, we also, maybe this is, uh, really uh, something people can see through, but it's about uh, communicating research, but also getting people to, to um, want to participate in our studies. So one study is uh, uh, people having problems, and then uh, we were randomizing people to either a, a, um, a, a targeted treatment for the gambler, or uh, you could be randomized to the gambler plus the uh, significant other. Uh, and the idea is that if you involve the significant other, once you have a lot of problems, then maybe that would be better. And the final study uh, the, that's, uh, that I'll be talking about really shortly and making uh, um, a, a short commercial for uh, is if, um, if you do have a, uh, someone that you know and that does not want to seek treatment, then this is like the craft model. You involve the, the significant other, and the significant other is the one that is getting the treatment or, or getting the, the, the training. And then that person will change the environment, the context for the gambler, uh, and trying to enable the gambler to seek treatment or, or actually stop, stop uh, doing that. So these are something that uh, if, you, if you know one, someone, uh, then you can recommend this, and it's free. Uh, so then I will show you, so this is uh, what I have been doing, the, the past road, and now what's uh, ahead, uh, and the brains behind this is, I'm like a small tiny brain cell, but the real brain is Jacob, uh, who's my PhD student, uh, so Jacob Johansson, uh, is, is uh, um, much credited here. Uh, so I think that the important thing is we know that treatment works if you get people to treatment, but the problem is getting people to treatment. And actually, the problem before that is, uh, is even having to offer treatment. It would be better if you could prevent people uh, needing treatment. So the idea here is, is me uh, really rudimental photoshopping, but uh, maybe we could have some kind of protective bubble uh, that would prevent people from, from uh, uh, getting um, problems f from their gambling. So in Sweden, you usually say that it's any given time there would be 120,000 120, people having problems in one way or another. Uh, and if you were to look at this in, in one year's time from now, it would still be the same number, but about 100,000 out of the 120,000 will, will have changed. So there is a lot of people going in and having problems and then going out. And it would be so nice if we could, could uh, limit these uh, new recruits. So, uh, together with Puff, we've uh, uh, gotten this uh, opportunity of uh, getting a PhD student. So, that's in Sweden, it's really expensive. It's a three million uh, kroner thing uh, to get a PhD student to pay for that uh, for four years. And that's not because the PhD student is, is uh, uh, living a luxury life, it's because of all the taxes. That goes to nice things. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's expensive. So I'm really happy that I, I, I got the full coverage for the PhD students. So the four studies um, uh, will be carried out by a PhD student that, that will be uh, announced soon at Stockholm University. So if any of you are interested, then you should apply. Um, so if you want to be my PhD student, then you can apply. So the idea is, um, uh, one of the things is uh, trying to set limits. So it shouldn't be... Uh, setting limits, uh, to be short. So the first study is, uh, uh, the goal is to increase the proportion of setting limits, uh, and we're trying to manipulate different ways of doing this. Uh, so we'll be uh, in doing this on, on real uh, players that consent, of course, uh, and then we will have different variations of, of getting people to do this. And um, 
um, there is, uh, uh, I will be sending out the link, I think, that you can watch. It's a three minute video about the fresh start effect, which is really enthusiastic and, and gives you a good uh, um, psychological rationale why, why it could be a good thing not setting a limit or not deciding to do something now. Maybe the, uh, you will increase the proportion of people doing something, changing behavior if you don't uh, do it now, but uh, do it in the future. Uh, so uh, that's something that we'll be working on. Um, something that's really interesting is that all these studies will be uh, about 15, mm, 15 months in length. So we'll be doing a, a three month um, uh, inclusion phase, and then we'll be doing uh, things, manipulating and, and doing uh, um, randomizations, and people are, of course, uh, consenting to this. Uh, but then we, we will have data uh, that uh, are real data, data on, on real people playing real money, um, and then seeing how, how things turn out for these people. And, and the uh, idea is then to communicate, publish this and communicate so that the, the industry and, and the um, uh, uh, researchers know what, what is best. So study two is uh, um, how do you, so say that you can uh, it identify people that, that are having problems or will soon be having problems, how should you communicate with those, these people uh, in order to, to maximize the, the good things uh, and, and uh, not uh, getting people into um, bad uh, behaviors. So that's the second study. Uh, the third study is, is a little bit like that one. It's um, uh, giving feedback to, uh, on gambling activities in different ways uh, and then manipulating that and see what is, what is best uh, received. Uh, and the final study uh, is the fourth study, which is not decided yet. So that's good, because sometimes when you write uh, grant proposals, you say, I will be doing this and this, and that's really what the future is about. And then you promise that, and then looking back, back four years, uh, then you would say, that was a stupid idea. So the good idea here is that we will be able to do what is uh, interesting at a time. So this will be decided in about two and a half, three years. So then we will be really cutting edge, hopefully. So that's what I uh, had to say, uh, small, um, uh, small teasers of, of what's coming. Uh, I know I'm in the way of, of your coffee and probably some snack. Uh, so uh, if you want to speak to me, uh, then uh, I'll be around, uh, probably holding a, a good sandwich. Thank you. <laughs>